we continue the murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the unusual horror of the thing, but dismiss the idle opinions of this print. It appears to me that this mystery is considered insoluble, for the very reason which should cause it to be regarded as easy of solution, I mean for the outer character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled too by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention with the facts that no one was discovered upstairs but the assassinated Mademoiselle Le Espinay, and that there were no means of aggress without the notice of the party ascending. The wild disorder of the room, the corpse thrust, with the head downward, up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady. These considerations, with those just mentioned and others which I need not mention, have suffered to paralyze the powers by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They have fallen into the gross, but common error of confounding the unusual with the obtruse. But it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the true. In investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much axed what has occurred as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the faculty which I shall arrive with are, have arrived, at the solution of this mystery is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now awaiting, continued he, looking toward the door of our apartment, I am now awaiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of these butcheries, must have been in some measure implicated in their perpetration of the worst portion of the crimes committed it is probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. I look for the man here in this room every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him. Here are pistols, and we both know how to use them when occasion demands their use. I took the pistols scarcely knowing what I did or believing what I heard, while well, Dupin went on very much as if in a soliloquy. I have already spoken of his abstract manner at such times. His discourse was addressed to myself, but his voice, although by no means loud, had that intonation which is commonly employed in speaking to someone at a great distance. His eyes, vacant in expression, regarded only the wall, that the voices heard in contention, he said, by the party upon the stairs, were not the voices of the women themselves, was fully proved by the evidence. This relieves us of all doubt upon the question where the old lady could have first destroyed the daughter, and afterwards have committed suicide. I speak this point chiefly for the sake of method. For the strength of Madame la Espinay would have been utterly unequal in the task of thrusting her daughter's corpse up the chimney as it was found, and the nature of the wounds upon her own person entirely preclude the idea of self-destruction. Murder, then, has been committed by some third party, and the voices of this third party were those heard in contention. Let me now <coughs> avert not to the whole testimony respecting these voices, but to what was peculiar in that testimony. Did you observe anything peculiar about it? I remarked, while all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, 
there was much disagreement in regard to the shrill, or, as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. That was the evidence itself, said Dupin, but it was not the peculiarity of the evidence. It was not, but to what was peculiar in that testimony. Did you observe anything peculiar about it? I remarked that while all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, there was much disagreement in regard to the shrill, or as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. That was the evidence itself, said Dupin, but it was not the peculiarity of the evidence. You have observed nothing distinctive yet. There was something to be observed. The witness, his, as you remark, agreed about the gruff voice. They were here unanimous, but in regard to the shrill voice, the peculiarity is not that they disagreed, but that while an Italian, an Englishman, a Spaniard, a Hollander, and a Frenchman attempted to describe it, each one spoke of it as that of a foreigner. Each is sure that it was not the voice of one of his own countrymen. Each likens it not to the voice of an individual of any nation with whose language he is conversant, but the converse. The Frenchman supposes it the voice of a Spaniard, and might have distinguished some words he had been acquainted with. The Spanish, the Dutchman, maintains it to have been that of a Frenchman, but we find it stated that not understanding French, this witness was examined through an interpreter. The Englishman thinks it the voice of a German that does not understand German. The Spaniard is sure that it was that of an Englishman, but judges by the intonation altogether, as he has no knowledge of the English. The Italian believes it the voice of a Russian, but has never conversed with a native of Russia. A second Frenchman differs. Moreover, with the first, and is positive that the voice was that of an Italian, but not being cognizant of that tongue, is like the Spaniard, convinced by the intonation. Now how strangely unusual must that voice have really been about which such testimony as this could have been elicited, in whose tones even denizens of the five great divisions of Europe could recognize nothing familiar. You will say that it might have been the voice of an Asiatic or an African, Neither Asiatics nor Africans abound in Paris, but without denying the inference, I will now merely call your attention to three points. The voice was termed by one witness harsh rather than shrill. It is represented by two others to have been quick and unequal. No words, no sounds resembling words, were by any witness mentioned as distinguishable. I know not, continued Dupin what impression I may have made so far upon your own understanding, but I do not hesitate to say that legitimate deductions, even from this portion of the testimony, the portion respecting the gruff and shrill voices, are in themselves sufficient to engender a suspicion which should give direction to all farther progress in the investigation of the mystery. I said legitimate deductions, but my meaning is not thus fully expressed. I design to imply that the deductions are the sole proper ones, and that the suspicion arises inevitably from them as the single result. What the suspicion is, however, I will not say just yet. I merely wish you to bear in mind that, with myself, it was sufficiently forcible to give a definite form, a certain tendency to my inquiries in the chamber. Let us now transport ourselves in fancy to this chamber. What shall we seek here first, the means of Egress employed by the murderers, it is not too much to say that neither of us believe in preternatural events. Madame and Mademoiselle la Espinay were not destroyed by spirits. The doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. I also don't believe in ghouls, um, you know, spirits that can physically hurt you. You know, the jinn don't do that. Um, they can convince other people, but it's upon your own beliefs, right? And they don't possess you and force you to do things either, so, you know, both those meanings of ghoul.
uh, using the Arabic word ghoul, not the Ku Klux Klan or even the English one. Um, yeah, the Ku Klux Klan has a rank ghoul. I'm not sure exactly how that plays out, but they're talking about that in the news because someone who used to be in the Klan is running for office. Um, the doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. Then how? Fortunately, there is but one mode of reasoning upon the point, and that mode must lead us to a definite decision. Let us examine, each by each, the possible means of egress. It is clear that the assassins were in the room where Mademoiselle La Espinay was found, are at least in the room adjoining when the party ascended the stairs. It is then only from these two apartments that we have to seek issues. The police have laid bare the floors, the ceilings, and the masonry of the walls in every direction. No secret issues could have escaped their vigilance, but not trusting to their eyes, I examined with my own. There were then no secret issues. Both doors leading from the rooms into the passage were securely locked with the keys inside. Let us turn the chimney. Let's to the ch <clears throat> Let us turn to the chimneys. These, although of ordinary width, were some eight or ten feet above the hearths, will not admit, throughout their extent, the body of a large cat. The possibility of egress, by means already stated, being thus absolute, we are reduced to the windows through those of the front room. No one could have escaped without notice from the crowd in the street. The murderers must have passed then through those of the back room, now brought to this conclusion and so unequivocal a manner as we are. It is our it is not our part as reasoners to reject it on account of apparent impossibilities. It is only left for us to prove that these apparent impossibilities are in reality not such. There are two windows in the chamber. One of them is unobstructed by furniture and is wholly visible. The lower portion of the other is hidden from view by the head of the unwieldy bedstead, which is thrust close up against it. The former was found securely fastened from within. It resisted the utmost force of those who endeavored to raise it. A large gimlet hole has been pierced in its frame to the left, and a very stout nail was found fitted therein, nearly to the head. Upon examining the other window, a similar nail was seen similarly fitted into place. And a vigorous attempt to raise the sash failed also. The police were now entirely satisfied that the egress had not been in these directions, and therefore it was thought a matter of irrigation to withdraw the nails and open the window. My own examination was somewhat more particular, and was so for the reason I have just given, because here it was I knew that all apparent impossibilities must be proved to be not such in reality. I proceeded to think thus. A posteriori, the murderers did escape from one of these windows. This being so, they could not have refastened the sashes from the inside as they were found fastened. The consideration which put a stop through its obviousness to the scrutiny of the police in this quarter, yet the sashes were fashioned. They must then have the power of fastening themselves. There was no escape from this conclusion. I stepped to the unobstructed casement, withdrew the nail with some difficulty, and attempted to raise the sash. It resisted all my efforts as I had anticipated. A concealed spring must I now knew exist, and this corroboration of my idea convinced me that my premises, at least, were correct. However, mysterious and still appear the circumstances attending the nails. A careful search soon brought to light the hidden spring. I pressed it, and satisfied with the discovery, forbore to upraise the sash. I now replaced the nail and regarded it attentively. A person passing out through this window might have reclosed it, and the spring would have caught, but the nail could not have been replaced. The conclusion was plain, and again narrowed in the field of my investigations. The assassins must have escaped through the other windows, supposing then the springs upon each sash to be the same, as was probable. There must be found a difference between the nails, or at least between the modes of the fixture. 
getting upon the sacking of the bedstead, I looked over the headboard minutely at the second casement. Passing my hand down behind the board, I readily discovered and pressed the spring, which was, as I suppose, identical in character with its neighbor. I now looked at the nail. It was as stout as the other, and apparently fitted in the same manner, driven in nearly up to the head. You will say that I was puzzled, but if you think so, you must have misunderstood the nature of the inductions. To use a sporting phrase, I had not been once at fault. The scent had never for an instant been lost. There was no flaw in any link of the chain. I had traced the secret to its ultimate result, and that result was the nail. It had, I say, in every respect the appearance of its fellow in the other window, but this fact was an absolute nullity, conclusive as it might seem to be when compared with the consideration that here, at this point, terminated the clue. There must be something wrong, I said, about the nail. I touched it and the head with about a quarter of an inch of the shank came off of my fingers. The rest of the shank was in the gimlet hole. Where it had been broken off, the fracture was an old one, for its edges were encrusted with rust and had apparently been accomplished by the blow of a hammer, which had partly embedded in the top of the bottom sash the head portion of the nail. I now carefully replaced this head portion in the indentation whence I had taken it, and the resemblance to a perfect nail was complete. The fissure was invisible. Pressing the spring, I gently raised the sash for a few inches. The head went with it, remaining firm in its bed. I closed the window, and the semblance of the whole nail was again perfect. The riddle so far was now unriddled. The assassin had escaped through the window which looked upon the bed, dropping of its own accord upon his exit, or perhaps purposely closed. It had become fastened by the spring, and it was the retention of the spring which had been mistaken by the police for that of the nail. Farther inquiry being thus considered unnecessary, the next question was that of the mode of descent. Upon this point, I had been satisfied in my walk with you around the building. About five feet and a half from the casement in question, there runs a lightning rod. From this rod, it would have been impossible for anyone to reach the window itself to say nothing of entering it. I observed, however, that the shutters of the fourth story were of the pe peculiar kind called by a Parisian carpenters, freights, a kind already employed at the present day, but frequently seen upon the very old mansions at Lyons and Bordeaux. They are, in the forms, the form of an ordinary door. A single, not a folding door, except that the upper half is latticed, or working in open trellis, thus affording an excellent hold for the hands. In the present instance, these shutters are fully three feet and a half broad. When we saw them from the rear of the house, they were both about half open, that is to say, they stood off at right angles from the wall. It is probable that the police, as well as myself, examined the back of the tenement, but if so, in looking at these broads in the line of their breadth, as they must have done, they did not perceive this great breadth itself, or at all events failed to take it into due consideration. In fact, having once satisfied themselves that no aggress could have been made in this quarter, they would naturally bestow here a very cursory examination. It was clear to me, however, that the shutter belonging to the window at the head of the bed would is swung fully back to the wall reach to within t two feet of the lightning rod. It was also evident that by exertion of a very unusual degree of activity and courage, an entrance into the window from the rod might have been thus effected. By reaching to the distance of two feet and a half, we now suppose the shutter open to its whole extent. A robber might have taken a firm grasp upon the trellis work, letting go then his hold upon the rod, placing his feet securely against the wall and springing boldly from it. He might have swung the shutter so as to close it, and if we imagine the window open at the time, might even have swung himself into the room.
I wish you to bear especially in mind that I have spoken of a very unusual degree of activity as requisite to success in so hazardous and so difficult a feat. It is my design to show you first that the thing might possibly have been accomplished, but secondly, and chiefly, I wish to impress upon your understanding the very extraordinary, the almost preternatural character of that agility which could have accomplished it. You will say, no doubt, using the language of the law, that to make out my case, I should rather undervalue than insist upon a full examination of the activity required in this matter. This may be the practice in law, but it is not the usage of reason. My ultimate object is only the truth. My immediate purpose is to lead you to a place in juxtaposition that very unusual activity of which I have just spoken, with that very peculiar, shrill, or harsh, and unequal voice about whose nationality no two persons could be found to agree, and in whose utterance no syllabification could be detected. At these words, a vague and half-formed conception of the meaning of Dupin flitted over my mind. I seemed to be upon the verge of comprehension, without the power to comprehend, as men at all times find themselves upon the brink of remembrance, without being able, in the end, to remember. My friend went on with this discourse. You will see, he said, that I have shifted the question from the mode of egress to that of ingress. It was my design to suggest that both were affected in the same manner, at the same point. Let us now revert to the interior of the room. Let us survey the appearances here. The drawers of the bureau, it is said, had been rifled, although many articles of apparel still remained within them. The conclusion here is absurd. It is a mere guess. A very silly one, and no more. How are we to know that the articles found in the drawers were not all these drawers had originally contained? Madame Le Espinay and her daughter lived an exceedingly retired life saw no company, seldom went out, had little use for numerous changes of habiliment. These, those found, were at least of as good quality as any likely to be possessed by these ladies. If a thief had taken any, why did he not take the best? Why did he not take all? In a word, why did he abandon four thousand francs in gold to encumber himself with a bundle of linen. The gold was abandoned. Nearly the whole sum mentioned by Monsieur Mignard, the banker. Was discovered in bags upon the floor. I wish you, therefore, to discard from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive engendered in the brains of the police by that portion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house. Coincidences, ten times as remarkable as this, the delivery of the money and murder committed within three days upon the party receiving it, happen to all of us every hour of our lives without attracting even momentary notice. Coincidences in general are great stumbling blocks in the way of that class of thinkers who have been educated to know nothing of the theory of probabilities, that theory to which the most glorious objects of human research are indebted for the most glorious of illustration. In the present instance, had the gold been gone, the fact of its delivery three days before would have been formed something more than a coincidence. It would have been corroborative of this idea of motive but under the real circumstances of the case, if we are to suppose gold the motive of this outrage, we must also imagine the perpetrator so facilitating an idiot as to have abandoned his gold and his motive together. Keeping now steadily in mind the points to which I have drawn your attention, that peculiar voice, that unusual agility, and that startling absence of motive in a murder so singularly atrocious as this. Let us glance at the butchery itself. Here is a woman strangled to death, 
by manual strength and thrust up a chimney, head downward. Ordinary assassins employ no such modes of murder as this. Least of all, they thus dispose of the murdered in the manner of thrusting the corpse up the chimney. You will admit that there was something excessively outer, something altogether irreconcilable with our common notions of human action, even when we suppose the actors the most depraved of men. Think, too, how great must have been that strength which could have thrust the body up such an aperture so forcibly that the united vigor of several persons was found barely sufficient to drag it down. Turn now to other indications of the employment of a vigor most marvelous. On the hearth were thick tresses, very thick tresses, of gray human hair. These have been torn out by the roots. You're aware of the great force necessary in tearing thus from the head, even twenty or thirty hairs together. You saw the locks in question as well as myself. Their roots, a hideous sight, were clotted with fragments of the flesh of the scalp. Sure token of the prodigious power which had been exerted in uprooting, perhaps, half a million of hairs at a time. The throat of the old lady was not merely cut, but the head absolutely severed from the body. The instrument was a mere razor. I wish you also to look at the brutal ferocity of these deeds. Of the bruises upon the body of Madame la Espinay, I do not speak. Monsieur de Mas and his worthy coadjutor, Monsieur Etienne, have pronounced that they were inflicted by some obtuse instrument. And so far, these gentlemen are very correct. The obtuse instrument was clearly the stone pavement in the yard, upon which the victim had fallen from the window, which looked in upon the bed. This idea, however simple, it may now seem, escaped the police for the same reason that the breath of the shutters escaped them, because by the affair of the nails, their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows, having ever been opened at all. If now, in addition to all these things, you have properly reflected upon the odd disorder of the chamber, we have gone so far as to combine the ideas of an agility astounding, a strength superhuman, a ferocity brutal, a butchery without motive, a grotesquerie and horror absolutely alien from humanity, and a voice foreign in tone to the ears of men of many nations, and void of all distinct or intelligible solidification. What result, then, has ensued? What impression have I made upon your fancy? I felt a creeping of the flesh as Dubin asked me the question. A madman, I said, has done this deed, or some raving maniac escaped from a neighboring it's in descent. In some respects, he replied, your idea is not irrelevant, but the voices of madmen, even in their wildest paroxysms, are never found to tally with that peculiar voice heard upon the stairs. Madmen are of some nation and their language, however incoherent in its words, has always the coherence of syllabification. Of syllabification. <clears throat> Besides, the hair of a madman is not such as I now hold in my hand. I disentangle this little tuft from the rigidity, from the rigidly clutched fingers of Madame la Espinay. Tell me what you can make of it. Dupin, I said, completely unnerved, this hair is most unusual. This is no human hair. I have not asserted that it is, said he. But before we decide this point, I wish you to glance at the little sketch. I have here traced upon this paper. It is a facsimile drawing of what has been described in one portion of the testimony as dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails upon the throat of Mademoiselle Espinay, and another by Messrs. Dumas and Etienne as a series of livid spots, evidently the impression of fingers. You will perceive, continued my friend, spreading out the paper upon the table before us, that this drawing gives the idea of a firm and fixed hold. There is no slipping apparent. Each finger has retained, possible, possibly, until the death of the victim, the fearful grasp by which it originally embedded itself. Attempt now to place all your fingers at the same time in the respective impressions as you see them. 
I may attempt in vain. We are possibly not giving this matter a fair trial, he said. The paper is spread out upon a plain surface, but the human throat is cylindrical. Here is a billet of wood, the circumference of which is about that of the throat. Wrap the drawing around it and try the experiment again. I did so, but the difficulty was even more obvious than before. This, I said, is the mark of no human hand. Read now, replied Dupin. This passage from... Cuvier. It was a minute. It, it was a minute, anatomical, and generally descriptive account of the large fulvus orang otang of the East Indian Islands, the gigantic stature, the prodigious strength and activity, the wild ferocity, and the Imitative propensities of these mammalia are sufficiently well known to all. I understood the full horrors of the murder at once. The description of the digits, said I, as I made an end of the reading, is in exact accordance with this drawing. I see that no animal but an orang otang of the species here mentioned could have impressed the indentations as you have traced them. This tuft of tawny hair, too, is identical in character with that of the beast of the Cuvier, but I cannot possibly comprehend the particulars of this frightful mystery. Besides, there were two voices heard in contention, and one of them was unquestionably the voice of a Frenchman. True, and you will remember an expression attributed almost unanimously by the evidence to this voice, the expression, Mon Dieu, this under the circumstances has been justly characterized by one of the witnesses, Montaigne the Convectioner, and as an expression of remonstrance or expostulation upon these two words, therefore I have mainly built my hopes of a full solution of the riddle. A Frenchman was cognizant of the murder. It is possible, indeed, it is far more than probable, that he was innocent of all participation in the bloody transactions which took place. The orangutan might have escaped from him. He might have traced it to the chamber, but... Under the agitating circumstances which ensued, he could never have recaptured it. It is still at large, and will not pursue these guesses, for I have no right to call them more, since the shades of reflection upon they are basely are scarcely of sufficient depth to be appreciable by my own intellect, but and since I could not pretend to make them intelligible to the understanding of another, we will call them guesses then, and speak of them as such at the Frenchman in question is indeed, as I suppose, innocent of this atrocity, this advertisement, which I left last night upon our return home at the office of the Monde, a paper devoted to the shipping interest as much by sailors, will bring him to our residence. He handed me a paper, and I read thus, caught in the voice de Belong, early in the morning of the inst the morning of the murder, a very large tawny orangutan of the Bornese species, the owner, who is ascertained to be a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, may have the animal again upon identifying it satisfactorily and paying a few charges arising from its capture and keeping. Call at no rue Faubourg St. Germain, au Prisime. How is it possible, I asked, that you should know the man to be a sailor and belonging to a Maltese vessel? Yeah, you wouldn't expect a monkey to go off and kill people, would you?